I've finished going through this book, uh, beginning to end. It's taken me about half a year to go from the start to the finish, just digesting all of the, the grammar that I come across. Where I'm at with the language now is that I there's a lot that I can recognize, a few hundred uh, different vocabulary items. Uh, I can recognize the beginnings and ends that join onto those and how they form sentences together. Um, but what I'm not able to do is have a conversation and all that I need left to do to be able to speak the language is to start speaking it because I've already got a foundation of uh, vocabulary and, and, and grammar that I can begin to work with. I've really enjoyed everything about this. I mean, language is such a fascinating topic on its own. And just that there are some ways of expressing meanings and concepts that I've come across in this study of Pitanjara that I would never have found if I'd studied a more conventional or a more commonly studied language. Linguistically, this language is super, super interesting. There's all sorts of grammar features in there that are just um, unexpected. Ways of shaping meaning, ways of expressing concepts that uh, for someone from, especially an English speaking background, but more broadly speaking, from a, from a, a European background, someone who speaks the language of a colonizer, uh, this language is immensely interesting, the way that it shapes the world, the way that it uses suffixes to show intention, for example, and shades of intention at that. <laughs> I find that stuff very, very interesting. It's not for everybody. Studying an endangered language or a minority language is is really not for everybody. It's uh, you have to set aside that practical part of your brain that says, "Why study this if I can't speak it to anybody?" And the answer is you can, but it's really hard to find <laughs> someone to speak with. Um, so if you want. A language that's useful for travel or business then this won't be the one for you uh, but if you want a language if you want to study for the the intellectual thrill of it the linguistic um, fun linguistic fun then yes definitely study something that is as different as possible to a language you know and so yes I have had a lot of fun, difficult fun, <laughs> difficult fun getting through uh, this epic, epic work of, of description. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a description, this book, Wanka Wiru, one of the most comprehensive descriptions of a language that I have ever seen. And where it's gotten me in terms of practical skills is that when I see some text in um, Pitanjara or a different desert language dialect, I'm for the most part I'm able to get the gist of what I'm reading. And there are some shades of meaning that get lost. But that. I like grammar. I really do like learning about grammar, especially if there are concepts and and ways of thinking about the world that I've never, uh, I couldn't have come up with on my own. Uh, and this is one of the beautiful things about learning a language is that it just it can turn your whole um, way of looking at the world upside down. Uh, and that's why I think everyone should at least have some exposure in their life to a language very different to their native language. But like I said, this is not a language textbook and that's, that's kind of a shame. There's definitely room in the publishing space for something amazing to be put out. And in my other video, I've showing you how I used this sort of grammar stuff in this book to, um, as grammar exercises, as um, creative exercises almost. But what's lacking from this book is uh, firstly learner exercises and also the, it would be very useful. It, it, it's not the intention of this book, but it would be useful if it also included a chapter about um, more communicative elements to the language rather than just um, uh, lo lots of sentence examples of how things are put together and so on and so forth. But you get you get 
flooded with uh, examples of how sentences work. And I really appreciate that about this book. But uh, if I wanted to learn to communicate with the language, this is not the way, this is not the book for it. Uh, the other thing is that, the other thing that I've had trouble with while learning Pinjaro was the was not having a dictionary. Um, at the back of this book, there's um, a little bit, there's um, some thematic uh, vocabulary lists, but um, no such bilingual dictionary. And uh, what I've relied on, what I start when I started with the book, what I relied on doing was. Um, taking words and sentences, putting them into apps like Memorize and Anki. So that sparked a whole other project of mine, which was trying to create an electronic dictionary. And what that's up to, uh, and that's kind of on hold at the moment because uh, I've realized due to the, the structure of the language itself, I, I will need to learn some additional programming skills, things to do with or for any interested linguists out there, things to do with morphological parsing and, and analysis. Um, things that I just, um, it's beyond my current skill set, something that I'll have to look to do in the future. At the moment, what my dictionary can do is I have uh, about 500 sentences in a database, and my dictionary, if I search for a particular word um, in English or Pinjara, then I can return. A list of sentences that include that word. What it's what I'm not able to do is if I uh, let's say I have this particular grammar grammatical ending that I would like to see examples of that used in a sentence. Um, for example, unka, uh, ngka ending, which means that something it's attached to a noun to say that this is the location of an action. Right, so Muranka, something is happening at the Mura, which is like the, the house or the camp or just the place in general. So if I wanted to search Muka and see how that piece of grammar functions in a sentence, it doesn't perfectly work because it's going to pick up other words like Wanka, language. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's just not a perfect search. One of the issues that uh, a lot of language enthusiasts have is um, trying to decide how to spend your time and which languages to learn and which languages to maintain and revise. I just love reading in general so um, one of the things I love to do is read books in foreign languages and sometimes um, books that I've already read in English I'll read over and over again. It's a um, very old edition. Uh, I picked up a second hand shop uh, it's got someone's doodles all through it. Here's one. This is the book that taught me French because there was a really, really good audio book that I could listen to while reading. And it's short and engaging and I really, really enjoy this. I recommend this book to anybody. Yeah, one of the issues we have is trying to decide how to maintain and um, how to choose which language we're going to study. <laughs> There's a few languages here that I speak reasonably well, a few that I don't, and a few that I've never studied at all. But I've just collected books about them. And it's really hard to decide what do I want to do. Like, I really want to learn German because I've got these, these great old editions. These were from my, uh, my neighbor. Uh, it's printed on, it's like wax paper. This was, um, he, gave, he moved house so he gave me all these old books. And let's see, um, if it has a date in there, 1952, I'm afraid to touch these things because they're just going to, they're going to break, but I've carted these around, I've moved, moved maybe three times, I think I've moved three or four times just with a box, cardboard box with these antique books in it that I can't read and it's just insane, but German, German for me holds very little appeal other than to be able to read the stuff that I have here. And um, there's often an emotional choice in, in language learning, deciding which language you want to learn and which one you don't. And for me, German has not, it doesn't have that element to it. It doesn't have that emotional factor. So I don't really know when I'll ever 
read these books. Now that I'm not spending much of my time learning good grammar for Western Desert language, uh, that frees up some time in my language schedule. Um, so I'm faced with a choice. Do I double down on the Irish that I'm doing? That was my other, uh, my other active language. Should I spend, uh, <laughs> should my Irish study then uh, overflow into the time that I've gained back? Or should I use that other time to pick up or revise another language? And this is the hardest choice. I'm, I'm kind of tempted to spend the time with Scots Gaelic as well. Um, it's just different enough to Irish to be weird and, <laughs> and unfamiliar, but at the same time it's got so much in common that maybe I feel like, that maybe I'll feel like I'm still revising Irish at the same time. I might just give that a go for a couple of weeks and then see how that feels and then maybe it'll become a whole thing of its own and maybe after a few weeks I'll drop it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think, um, Maybe it's time for Scottish, but at the same time, I don't know. Maybe I should be revising one of my old languages. Maybe, um, maybe it's time to bring the Mandarin back. Maybe it's time to bring Ch uh, the Spanish back. Spanish has been a long time. Long, long, long time since I, I used to live in Spain, but now I don't. And what about French? French, I had so much attention to in the past, but maybe it's time I got French back on. Oh. What do I do? What do I do? And I've been thinking Greek is high on the list as well. Greek's been up on the list for a long time, but it never made it to the top. So now that I'm not spending time with Western Desert, should I replace it with Greek? Should I come back to my Chinese? Or I don't know. I'm sort of feeling like the Chinese will be, uh, will require the strongest effort. Um, it's really, really hard to decide. Really hard to decide.